Uh, the Bunny Boy was really in the uh, what we call the swinging swinging sixties in London, and the Bunny Club was a big organisation in London. We were just beginning at the end of the sixties to talk about the context of women's um, presentations, how they were, and so the Bunny Club had these weird these weird Oh, no, these weird dresses, not dresses. They were, always wore these corsets that sort of pushed the breasts up here, almost to their chin, you know. And uh, it was, of course it was run by uh, Hefner, Hugh Hefner, who was always in his dressing gown. But they were there with these, you know, boobs and everything. And I thought, well, you know, that's not the only way we have to see ourselves. This is not the mirror of myself. I don't think I look like that. I think I look quite good how, how I am, but not like that. That's not the ideal that I want to imitate. And so I thought, well, let's make you into a, a bunny, bunny boy, really. So I put him in the same outfits and gave him floppy ears. He didn't have the little ones that they had, but he had the floppy ones. And, um, you know, I gave him breasts and the basque and stockings, and I gave him a bunny for a penis. And he was, uh, you know, with it. So that's how it came about. Um, at the opening of the exhibition, all these people turned up from the bunny club, and nobody could understand, well, how did they know? And we didn't invite them. And so they, there they were. Um, and then the bunny boy disappeared. You know, the drawing disappeared after the opening night. The context at that time was quite difficult to describe because in some ways it was very liberal. <clears throat> London was a very liberal place and if you went to Carnaby Street, everybody was dressing and, you know, up in different things. And uh, Mick Jagger was, um, in the doing the concerts, the Rolling Stones were in the concerts. They used to come and play for us at the academy schools. Of course, Mick Jagger would, would be wearing the equivalent of a frock. So, of course, she thought, "Okay, it's it's okay to do this now. Now I can sort of make fun of this stuff." But there was a division between that sort of so-called normalized behaviour, between the notion of women wearing those kind of outfits at the Bunny Club and waiting on men to someone like Mick Jagger, you know, dancing along on the stage, you know, with his nice sort of silky little dress. Yeah, well, the opening went very well. It was absolutely cram-packed and I was quite pleased and people were very flattering. And then when I went in the next day to just talk to the owner of the gallery, uh, he had a manager in there and uh, she looked very white and shaken and I said, I looked around the gallery, I said, but where's the work? And she said, oh, we had to take it down. I said, no, you didn't. She said, yes, we did. The police came in and they said, if you don't take this down, we'll close the gallery. So obviously she was frightened of having her gallery closed down completely. And I said, oh, okay, I get it, i just take. So we were gathering everything up, uh, myself and my partner, Conrad Atkinson, <clears throat> and we were sort of checking things off as we went along. And I found that the bunny boy was missing and I said, well, where's the bunny boy? And she said, isn't it there? And I said, no, it's not there. And then the guy who actually did the, some of the publicity, he came in and I said, uh, the, the bunny boy's missing. And he said, oh, no, it's no, it's not there. I said, it's gone, it's not here. We've looked everywhere. And after a while he said, I know who's got it. I said, well, who? He said, the bunny club, they must have taken it. No one else would take it, but they would not admit that they, they, they'd taken it. And I have a feeling that they just destroyed it to get rid of the evidence. And a few years later, 
when I was um, living in California, I actually met quite a few people from Hollywood and one of them was a, a woman called Berry Perkins, married to Anthony Perkins, who had just died and she was in a very distressed uh, state. And she said, um, I know Hugh. I said, oh, do you? She said, yes, I'll go and ask him. And she, I think she did ask him, but I never got it back. She didn't come back to me with it. So it's, it is gone forever. Well, I showed, when I went to California, I was asked by the university curator, would I do an, a show with them? And I said, you know, what do you think of this work? And I showed him The Bunny Boy, and I showed him Captain America, and a few of the other pieces. And he said, oh yeah, the students will love it. So I, took, I, I said, how many should we show then? Because they were more interested in the documentary type things. He said, oh, well, we could show about four or something like that. So we showed four of them. And sure enough, the students were totally fascinated. And I thought, it's the right time to show this work again. And then a little while later, I was asked by a gallery called Intersection for the Arts, which at that time was in next to the gay period, uh, uh, part of San Francisco. Well, it's all gay, but anyway, it was in the Haight. It was next to the Haight in the mission area. And the curator, Kevin Chen, said, um, I said to him, would you like to show some of this work? He said, oh yes, yeah, this is perfect, this is perfect. This will, we've been trying to find a way to relate to the gay community. And I said, so do you think they will like this work? And he said, yeah, I'm sure they will. And also, he said, we've got, um, we've got a group of young gay women and men, and they are trying to produce a project together for posters around the city. And he said, would you mind if I hold on to these, because I just brought the portfolio in, in for him, but for a while, while I show them. And I said, yeah, that's fine. So he showed them to them, this work to them. And he said, oh, they were so excited. You gave them permission to swap body parts around. <laughs> so, and they, they did, they created this whole new set of, you know, full size posters, like up to the top of your ceiling. And they were put in the underground, in the, in the metro, on, on the streets and everywhere. So it was like, it's the right time. There is no sort of problem with this work. So when my work went up, they'd all, the kids had already prepared the ground for me. It was really well received. Um, and we had a lot of reporting uh, from that, a lot of... Uh, um, Oh, I suppose, you know, newspaper articles and things, which were the main way of getting reviews. The curator said, you know, this is, this is really good for us. And then again, what happened was um, the art centre, Intersection for the Arts, was also uh, film and photography and uh, theatre. And they had a, a really interesting theatre and they had uh, a playwright, a resident playwright, and she put together a play about being gay and referred to my work. So it was, you know, it was a very interesting period. So again, I thought, well, I, maybe I'll make some more. So I did, I did created a few more pieces for, for that show. And um, also when I actually went to Manchester, Manchester had totally changed. When I was in Manchester in the 60s, after I finished uh, uh, college, or the academy schools, the place was kind of grim and um, dour. And when I went back, the gay community had to totally transformed it. The, there's an area called Canal Street, and it's, you know, it's totally enlivened. Everybody's marching up and down, you know, in their different outfits. And I said, oh, I think I'll show some of the work here. And there's a woman who was teaching uh, art history at the uh, university, and she did a, a piece in that little book, Heidi Rietmeier. 
And I said, Heidi, what do you think they'll think of this? She said, oh, this is perfect timing. <laughs> so I said, OK, let's do it. So I showed a lot of the drawings. I did show some of, more of the sort of rape pieces and the uh, home workers, but I also showed uh, the drawings. And again, it was well received. So it seemed to grow. It seemed to be the best timing for things. Um, so I've been given permission, ba basically, to actually uh, do that work. And what I began to realize, well, I didn't begin, I knew it was there, was that actually the subject matter was buried in the actual drawings. And it was didn't ha always have to be documentary, it didn't always have to explain everything, but it did have some of the messages were buried in the in the drawings. So there used to be a saying, um, the medium is the message. And basically what I was saying is the message is the message. I meant just in general because it was all out there anyway. So I could do it without thinking. Oh, it's not going to give problems to the to the gallery. It's going to be fine for them. I mean, my I wasn't worried about me, um, but I suppose in in the in the sixties period I was worried because I had this whole attack by uh, ger not journalists. It was paparazzi, what we call paparazzi, who were banging on my door and trying to take um, images of, of my skirt. But you know, we all all wore mini skirts then. And of course, they were sort of lying on the floor and taking photographs. So it was a really quite a, a nasty, horrible experience. And I didn't really want to go through that again. But I realised, no, I'm not going to go through that again. You're an old woman anyway. <laughs> and who wants to take photographs of your skirt? But <laughs> it's fine. It's not good. I was worried about the gallery, mostly, if they were going to be... Uh, put in a, a, a very bad position like the woman at Motif Editions had been. So the context of that, I thought, well, this is not the right time to be showing this work. It's not going to be understood. The irony is not going to be understood. And the, the notion of other messages is, is not going to be there. Let me be more straightforward. And I worked with my partner on an exhibition called Strike. And it turned out to be a women's strike in his home village because he'd been asked by the ICA uh, to do an exhibition. And he said, well, you know me my, by my paintings, but there's only one thing I want to do, and it's about this strike. And it surprisingly at the time said, yeah, that's fine, we'll, we'll let you do that. We brought all the strikers down from um, this little village where he, he lived or used to live and they talked about the strike. Now, what was interesting to me was that um, the, these women had been on strike for over a year. It was a thermometer factory, and at the time they used mercury, so it was dangerous. And the stuff was lying around all in bits and pieces around the village. And the kids used to play with this mercury, throwing it at each other. Anyway, it got this publicity, and the owner had said, if you carry on with this strike, we'll close down the factory. Well, it, it informed the people. They said, we'll move it all to London because of the factory in London. So the, the factory in London came out on strike. And the owners had to give in. They had to give them. It, was not, it was about, wasn't about money they were going on strike. It was about the conditions of work and they had to give in and actually do more health and safety checks. And they had to you know, sort out the conditions for the workers. And I thought, aha, we, you know, art can change the world <laughs> or can change sim simple things. And <clears throat> at the, um, we had, um, in the ICA, we had a, a discussion. They brought the strikers down from, I said, from the north of England which, you know, it was amazing because nobody ever did that in those days. They still don't. They still think the North is the outer reaches of the world. And the 
We also brought in a woman who was, we knew a woman called May Hobbs, who was the leader of the night cleaners campaign. And they all got together and talked, and also an MP, member of parliament, who was actually the member of parliament for our area in the north. And so there was a lot of debate and discussion, and because it was unusual to have an art event who talked about real events, then it got a lot of attention. And so then I said, I was actually um, at this reception. Another woman came up to me and said, um, she was part of the artist union with me, a woman called Mary Kelly. And she said, oh, we should work together, shouldn't we? Because she'd been involved in the night cleaners thing. I said, yeah, we'll do something. And we then we later developed Women and Work, which is part of the Tate um, gallery collection. And at the same time as I was working on that, I started working on women's work because you could actually see how the jobs were sinking lower and lower. And the women's jobs were getting low pay because they, they actually lowered the, um, the rate. They, they had strategies. You know, they would say 10 was the top wage and one was the bottom or two was the bottom. So those were slipping, the women's were put in the bottom, even though they were supposed to have equal pay. They found a way around the law. It was the, mo the moment when they were bringing in e the Equal Pay Act. And again, you sort of realize they can just circumvent the law. Some of the work was going out of the factories and into women's houses. So there's a piece of work in here which has, it's called the hands of law. It's the ones with the diagrams on. And that is part of that, that was a whole installation which actually had um, a painting which is in the Tate Gallery. And I talked to a lot of the home workers and interviewed a lot of them. And we, um, I then became friendly with um, one of the people who was very involved in the campaign, the Home Workers Campaign. And she said, as we went to that particular incident, this is government work. And I said, oh, well, can we do something about it? And she said, I will ask my partner, my husband, because he's an MP, he's a member of parliament. So he raised it in parliament. And what had happened was that the, the work she was doing, she was assembling tax forms, and the boxes were totally filled her house. In every room, even in, in a little sort of conservatory, it was totally full. And she, her sitting room, you know, she, you could barely walk through it because it was full of these boxes. And she was earning pennies per hour. And I said, well, why are you doing it? She said, well, we have to. We have very little money coming into the house. My husband's lost his job and we have to get some money from somewhere. And so I talked to her and um, took some photographs and um, sort of did an, did an interview like you're doing now. And we, we decided we would talk to her husband about it, who was a member of parliament. And he raised it in parliament at a debate and nobody knew that these women were being paid in pennies. Everybody was shocked, even the conservatives. <laughs> and so they got they got the rates, they got the rates changed. But what has been happening was it had been sort of outsourced so many times that it went from one person to another, one, you know, organization to another. They took their cut, went to another place, they took their cut. And then finally it got to the home workers who were actually doing the work and they were paid in pennies. So I did a, an exhibition about that which was um, a whole uh, whole gallery full of stuff. And we put it on in um, the South London Gallery. And at the same time I also did a piece of work about rape, which may be even more sort of uh, well known. And I asked, the, um, I asked the Rape Crisis Centre, I said, do you want to do something 
uh, within the gallery and they said, yeah, because there is no rape crisis centre in South London. Now, South London is an enormous area. There's about eight boroughs, nothing there. So they did a consultation session. They advertised it and did consultation session within the gallery. And in this art centre, it was called the Battersea Art Centre, there were several groups meeting. For instance, there was a theatre group and there were music groups. And the theatre group said, you know, could, would you mind if we commissioned someone to write a, a play about it? And I said, no, that's great. So they wrote a play and it was performed while it was on. So again, it was like another level of consciousness about what was happening in their area. People were just, it's invisible. It's the sort of thing that's invisible because in the case of the home workers, it was going into their houses and nobody knew about it. In the case of rape, nobody talked about it. It was the hidden, you know, the hidden sin. Rape was bought by the Arts Council for a particular exhibition in the Hayward Gallery. And I had a phone call from the head office of the Arts Council and they said, no, it wasn't, it was going to the Serpentine. And the Serpentine was a gallery where it was free entrance. And they said, we're going to move the exhibition. And I said, oh, because of your work. And I said, but why? They said, because it's unsuitable for children. And if they go, if they put it on in the Hayward Gallery, people will have to pay and it won't be as exposed. Well, of course, the journalists all got onto it and it became the biggest story of the year. <laughs> so by the time rape got to the Hayward Gallery, they had this sort of rope around it. And someone told me they had curtains which you could draw if you wanted to. And when they said nobody would nobody be interested in it, nobody would want to look at it. But it was like when I looked, when I went in, there were people sitting on the floor six deep in a circle around it. So again, when you think about it, it, it's art that can, you can make art which can make a difference. Now, not always can you sort of get that kind of attention, but it now, rape is one of the most lent artworks in the Arts Council collection. I tried to get it for several exhibitions. I don't know whether you tried it for here, but and I said, you know, there's one exhibition that I was in in, um, in the Midlands, in England. And I said, oh, why didn't you get uh, rape? They said, they wouldn't let us have it because it's always on loan. So I think that's kind of amazing. You know, and it's very flattering to me. I wish they'd paid me more. <laughs> but anyway, it's out in the world.